I'm Deborah Babcock, and I'm a co the co-chair of uh, MPD. I want to start off this session by telling you a little bit about MPD. Um, MPD was created in 2018 to uh, develop to identify biomarkers and targets and help clinical trial design for patients with Parkinson's disease. This slide shows you our uh, timeline. And uh, we're almost at the end, so this is a nice chance for us to look backwards. Uh, we had four milestones. Actually, let me go back there. We had four basic milestones. One, to uh, harmonize uh, existing cohorts, to use their biospecimens to do multiomics profiling, to build a platform, and then to identify our targets and biomarkers. So where are we? This slide gives you a little overview of the MPD Knowledge Portal. We have a um, public-facing website where people can get information about the program and register for access to the data. We then send them to access the data and analyze it on the Terra platform, which was built by our Verily partners, and you'll be hearing a little bit more about that from Matt Bookman after I finish. Uh, and then the data itself lives on the Google Cloud. In 2021, we were very lucky to uh, federate with the Global Parkinson's Genetics uh, Program, or GP2, which is an international effort to genotype 150,000 Parkinson's patients across the world. So uh, we now have their data and our data living on the same platform, accessible through the same data use agreement. This slide shows you a little bit about what uh, AMPD data is. The f on the uh, left side, you can see our harmonized cohorts. The first eight are our harmonized cohorts. Uh, these have longitudinal clinical data. We did whole genome sequencing, longitudinal transcriptomics, longitudinal proteomics on um, almost 11,000 subjects across these eight cohorts. Um, some of the uh, samples, most of the samples are longitudinal and uh, some in blood and CSF both. On the uh, right side of the screen, you can see the UPSID plot, which tells you exactly how many subjects have how much data. And we just very recently added whole genome and single nucleus uh, sequencing in postmortem tissue, uh, and we'll be hearing about that later too. Okay. Uh, and I also wanted to let you know that we still have a little bit more sequencing we're bringing in. We've got a transcriptomics in extracellular vesicles and a longitudinal transcriptomics uh, that we're doing in the Harvard Biomarker cohort. Okay, so uh, cohorts, uh, multiomics, platform, where are we with target and biomarker identification? So I wanted to highlight a couple of recent publications to let you know that we are working on it. Uh, both of these used, uh, both of these have validated these biomarker panels in multiple cohorts, including AMPD. So I wanted to highlight them. The HEP paper, the first one, uh, came up with four proteins that differentiate Parkinson's disease from controls. They also found five proteins that predict rapid symptom onset in uh, patients with Parkinson's disease. The Lou paper uh, was looking at transcripts and found increased expression of these five transcripts in patients whose cognitive deficits progress. Um, the other thing I want to add about this is that a lot of these proteins and transcripts are related to the immune system, which I think provides some nice support for our upcoming AMP Systems Biology of Inflammation project. The other thing I wanted to tell you about in the biomarker and target space is we have a target explorer. Uh, this tool is available for anybody to use. You don't need to be a registered user. But what it has are the targets and, uh, that have been identified by MPD users. We currently have over 13,000 targets on this tool for people to explore, so it's a really nice resource. Okay, This is just summarizes our accomplishments. 
what I told you, we've harmonized our uh, basic cohorts. We've done our multi-omic sequencing. We now have 11,000 subjects with all this data. We built our platform. We have over 1,000 registered users for the platform. And I think we made a pretty good dent in identifying biomarkers and targets. So um, we've been very pleased with uh, what we've been able to accomplish. The last thing I want to mention before I turn it over to the more interesting part of the talk is that uh, we were very fortunate in being granted a phase two of AMPD. So the AMP uh, PDRD, Parkinson's disease and related disorders, will build on the current AMPD cohort uh, by adding in other alpha-synucleinopathy cohorts. So Lewy body dementia, REM sleep behavior disorder, multisystem atrophy. Uh, these cohorts will also have the same deep sequencing that we did in AMPD, but there'll also be an increased emphasis on really deep multifactorial data analysis, and there'll be a focus on assay development. So if this sounds interesting to anybody, uh, or you know of somebody who might be interested, we are currently uh, rounding up partners so there are partnership opportunities, and if you think this might be for you, I would strongly encourage you to speak with our FNIH co uh, colleagues, Dr. Sri Pulagura and Heidi Blythe. And with that, I will turn it over to our partner at Verily, Matt Bookman. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Um, so I did want to talk about the AMPD Knowledge Platform and researcher resources that are available. Um, as, as Deb mentioned, uh, the goal is to identify biomarkers for Parkinson's disease and uh, by building out a, a data portal and tools portal. And the way I thought about you know, present, presenting this was a little bit in terms of going from, uh, from 2018 to now is first activating our partnership to build the platform and then what we're now doing to, to activate the community. So, um, you know, we, we had this goal to launch within two years and we had a really small team um, uh, of, of people who were dedicated, you know, some only 50% of the time uh, and, uh, and other other folks who are a, a shared resource, and then we had this large number of invested parties uh, across the partnership. And, uh, and I presented this in, in 2019, and it really you know, speaks to me a lot about the work that, that we're all doing here and across all of the AMPs. Um, there are times where we need to move quickly and we do go alone, and I feel like in some ways, part of the, the AMP PD project, sometimes we're, we're, going, uh, we're going alone not uh, in conjunction with the other AMP programs, and, uh, and across the PD community, we're actually going together, and that is taking us much farther. Um, and I just, just want to say I've been extremely impressed and, and heartened by the, the extent to which we have collaborated together. Uh, it's been fantastic. Um, so one of the first things that, uh, as we had this broad view of, of being asked to build a knowledge portal, um, there were a whole bunch of requirements that all came together um, and really as you started to, to work through it teased out that there were, there were separate components and if we could identify these separate components then we could really move, uh, move more quickly and have the expertise that we had available to us work on these different projects. So, you know, the data, the data was the most important thing. Um, we could build a portal, we could build data explorers, we could build a workbench, but none of that is of value without, without the data. Um, the portal is the thing that, the, the website that everybody goes to visit and is available to the public. The data explorers are custom tools. But now these are extremely high value and you've heard uh, folks talk about the, uh, the, the custom explorers that are built for some of the AMP programs. They're high value, but they're also high cost. It takes a lot to build them. 
And the researcher workbench is a general pur purpose workbench, and that's an opportunity to really leverage work that's happening um, outside of the life sciences community as well as then within the life sciences community. And that's where we, we got a lot of additional value. This is just a, a representation of it. Um, and so, like I said, we had all of these uh, available resources uh, to us. Um, this is a representation of how we broke out into working groups and, uh, and really got started. Um, and, uh, and here's how, how people uh, you know, were connected with the different programs and really activated. And we really could not have moved as quickly as we did and as effectively as we did without the, the excellent contributions that we got from, from everybody. All right, uh, really quickly, you know, fast forward to, to 2019 and what does, what does AMPD look like at that time? So as I mentioned, we have now by then a public facing portal uh, that was built by, built by Sapient and, uh, and content provided by the, uh, across the, the partnership from the, the, the scientific um, elements to the, the data governance description um, to the technical descriptions, um, all of that content being provided across the, the partnership. We had cu a custom data explorer um, for, uh, for researchers to get familiar with the data, um, to be able to, to uh, make, make sense and understand the data before getting down deeper into the researcher workbench. And the researcher workbench is really targeted towards computational biologists. Um, and, and people who want to run workflows and notebooks. As uh, Deb mentioned, you know, we have uh, one data use agreement for, for now uh, nine different uh, data sets, uh, PD-focused and related disease-focused data sets. And as re researchers go through and apply for access, um, they have one path to go down and they get access not just to data at that time, they get access to a whole set of tools um, and a whole, bit, a whole bunch of examples. Um, the, uh, the workbench is, is, a, uh, is a workbench, it's a, a platform that's available to them in the cloud. They don't need to take data out of the cloud um, and so they can, can come to the data and immediately get started uh, working with the data. This is another uh, uh, representation of that and just briefly, you know, when we launched we had clinical data, transcriptomics, and whole genome sequencing data. Um, all of this, you know, to note also, not only is, is the, the path towards getting access to all the data simple to researchers, but the actual administration of this becomes very easy for uh, on the operations side in that we have one group, one group that researchers need to be added to in order for them to get access to uh, data and tools and all the examples. All right, I'm gonna quickly move forward to AMPD today and, uh, and give you a, a quick overview. Um, it's now, you know, we now have uh, almost 11,000 participants in the harmonized data. Uh, it's been exciting to have uh, not only were there studies that we reached that we had been a part of the AMPD plan and that AMPD reached out to, but other studies actually came to AMPD and said, we love what you've done, we would like to be part of that, all under one data use agreement and on one platform. I'm gonna go through, we now have quite a few explorers, you know, there's a lot you can do over six years now. Um, that, uh, that over time really accrues. We have two different public uh, types of dashboards or data explorers, including the, uh, the now t the Target Explorer, which ramped up this year and was built off of Agura from the AMP AD program. Um, GP2 has, has uh, a couple of public data explorers. We have the tier one, we have two different tiers of data access in AMP PD. Um, for if you have access to the genomic data or not. Um, and you have uh, data explorers f uh, customized for those different uh, tiered accesses. We also now have a community contributed uh, data explorer, which, uh, which Dr. Craig may, may speak to, or his, his lab has, has provided, um, which, is, uh, which is fantastic. And this is something that we're, we're really excited about, the extent to which we are now getting uh, six years in, community contributions back to the platform. 
One of the great things about the researcher workbench is this idea of a workspace. So in its original conception, a workspace was where a researcher pulls together um, all of their different research, um, their data sets, their tools. They do all of this in a cloud-based environment. Um, and, and over time, we realized this is a great way to deliver data. This is a great way to, for a program like AMPD to deliver data and tools and examples uh, for, them, for them to use. So within, uh, within the researcher workbench, um, we, have, we have a public workspace, which for people who aren't even uh, there for AMPD, but who are using the Terra platform for research, they can find out all about AMPD. Um, and I'll quickly run through. We have a tier one getting started workspace. Um, we have five, six different tier two getting started workspaces. Um, and this allows people to get going very quickly, um, again, without any need to, to download the data, but to immediately be able to create their own analyses, uh, whether it's whole genome sequencing, proteomics, or transcriptomics uh, analysis. As I was mentioning, we're now getting uh, community-provided workspaces, which is fantastic. It's one of the great things about having the platform is the extent to which uh, researchers can then communicate uh, and, and contribute back. Last thing I want to cover is the outreach that's been done, there's been great outreach. Once you have this platform, you can do a lot of, um, uh, of outreach to researchers and you can walk through, you know, and, and uh, you know, they don't need to go take the data out and try to figure out how to run your, your example analyses on, uh, on their own uh, platforms. You can, uh, you can work with them. So we've had a number of great webinars, hackathons, and, uh, and lastly, I'll, I'll leave off with that we ha now have a, uh, a newsletter that, uh, that goes out on a regular basis and, uh, and is a great way to highlight releases, news and events, and, uh, and, and uh, spotlight researchers. All right, this is my last, uh, last slide, which is, uh, as Deb mentioned, we have about 1,000 uh, researchers who have used the platform. Um, we're starting to see coming in the, uh, the aggregation of targets um, as well as publications. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for the, for the honor to, to be here and present um, the group effort on the AMPD in terms of the single nucleus RNA-seq analysis. Um, so I'm going to start and say that that was kind of an ambitious project that we were supposed to finish within a year, and the goal was to actually collect 100 brains, postmodern brains, coming from cases with PD and controls. Initially, we were targeting three different brain regions, each one affected at different stage of PD progression, and then we have one extra region that we can actually use as a control. Finally, during the, this kind of project, we were also able to expand another fifth brain region, which I'm going to explain the reason why we did that. And finally, the goal was to produce the data, uh, pre-process the data to QC, and then release through the AMPD knowledge portal. And the good news is today I'm going to show you that resource, and everything that I'm going to discuss today in terms of the data, you can actually go to the AMPD knowledge portal that Matt just presented, and you can get all the data from there. All right, so in terms of the brain uh, region selection, um, we actually use a staging system. This is coming from BRAC, specifically for Parkinson's disease. And we actually pick up three brain regions, each one affected in different stages of progression. So that's a dorsal motor nucleus of the 10th nerve, which is affected in BRAC stage one and two. Then we have the caudate nucleus, which is stage three. And then for more advanced stages, we actually add the primary motor cortex and specifically target the one that is it's related to the upper extremities. As a control region, we decided to go with the visual cortex instead of cerebellum, because in terms of site architecture, it seems to be more close to the other cortical regions that we include as part of the AppND profiling. Finally, as part of a supplement through NIA, we were actually able to add the fifth region. This is the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, and that can really allow us to bridge this effort with other efforts that you heard this morning from the AD and really be able to do cross disorder analysis with other ongoing kind of projects. So from each individual, we were getting whole genome sequence data. 
we were getting, target was to get 4,000 single nuclear profiles for each dissection. And then we were also doing some additional QC primarily in the visual cortex. So this is kind of the, um, the cohort that we were able to put together. Uh, we try to keep um, an equal ratio of males, females, and we try to do our best. In terms of diversity, we have been more successful in other efforts. Here, I have to say that it was quite challenging to get like brains coming from non-European white individuals, but hopefully that's gonna be something that we can actually work in the future. One of the goals here was to actually add PD cases that they have a very early stage of the disease, and this is BRAC stage one and two, which most of those cases then sometimes they don't even have clinical manifestation. So these are individuals that we have to do very detailed pathology and identify those very early cases. Now, as you can see from here, to do that and get early stage disease cases, these are individuals that we actually have from post-mortem collections. Um, in addition, we also have one cohort coming from a UDAL center that these are individuals that they have assessment as part of undermortem uh, clinical enrollment. And for those, we also have longitudinal clinical data. In terms of the protocol, everything has been randomized and harmonized in a way that we have used similar approaches for other ongoing effort as part of the AMP-AD, PsychAD, and other brain consortia. And here we actually process and we bring dissections for all the different brain collections to a single site. We randomize all the individuals. We actually can pull six donors in a single run. And then for each pool, we can run at least two different 10x lanes. So that gives us some kind of technical replicates. At the same time, by pulling each individual together, we can actually eliminate some of the technical batch effects. Finally, we want to harmonize and normalize the different degree of debris that might exist across different donors. So each individual, we also have done nuclei sorting by using fax. And this is the, the QC and the number of donors after we actually did the library generation, the sequencing. So initially we processed 500 dissections. These are 100 individuals and five brain regions. We were able to complete and send for sequencing 494 libraries. And after all doing all the QC, we were able to retain with high quality data, data for 444 individuals. Now, as you can see here, um, for 80, 79 individuals, we have data across every, every brain region. And then of course we have um, some missing data but I'm happy to say that for the majority of the individuals, we were able to have a very complete data set. And as we were initially promised, we were targeting about 4,000 nuclei per individual, but as you can see here, we were able to exceed that number. We got almost 6,000 nuclei. In terms of the brain regions, on average, we have 90 individuals that we were able to include with single cell data. And as we discussed, we have about 5,000 nuclei per donor and per dissection. And overall, for each brain region, we can actually bring together and analyze about half a million nuclei uh, for, for that specific region. So it's a very good initial data set that we can do some powerful analysis. And um, depending on the outcomes, of course, we can actually think about future kind of directions, whether we need to do more kind of deprofiling in different brain regions. And then as part of this kind of effort, uh, the initial goal was to generate the data, do initial QC, and um, which actually we do a typical cell filtering approach. So this is like minimum filtering to have a data set that we can actually release to the public. So it's, uh, we, we not only release the raw data, but at the same time we have raw counts and also data that they have done some initial QC. So every investigator, you can actually go there and download those data. And these are pretty much ready to be analyzed. In addition, we also spend lots of time to do the genotype demultiplexing from each pool. And that's something that can take a significant amount of time, uh, which, in this case, um, the data are ready to, uh, they're ready for downstream analysis. So that was kind of the, what we actually were supposed to deliver to the MPD. Of course, we are extremely interested in this project and we have been very invested. So we actually have been continuing on doing this analysis. And after you have the pre-processed data in terms of single cell, there's many additional steps. Some of them, they're very time consuming. And one step that we're actually finalizing now is to be able to have a harmonized cell taxonomy. So we're working as part of the brain initiative and also bring some other kind of expert to make sure that we have a very robust cell taxonomy across the more than two million single cell profiles, that then that can become something that can expedite the downstream analysis. And all the data uh, have been released to the MPD portal. Uh, hopefully, um, 
people, they, it's easy for individuals to get access to those data. And uh, one of the things is that as we're making additional analysis, like the cell taxonomy, this is stuff that we're also going to allow to upload to the, to the community in the portal. Now, one important thing about the different kind of ARM project is the interest that when you generate data from one effort, it's going to be very important to be able to bring those data across many different other efforts. And we have been fortunate to also work in another project in parallel. So one, uh, one project I show you over here, this is the PsychAD. This is NIA funny project. It has a single brain region. This is the DLPFC or the prefrontal cortex. And that was actually the fifth brain region that we add to the AMPD. So now we can do an integrative cross disorder analysis. Um, so in this project we have done, it's a very large population scale study. We have 1,500 unique brain donors. And as you can see here, there's individual across different diseases, including Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, Parkinson, and other um, neurodegenerative and neuropsychiatric disorders. And we also have one important component is that one third of the donors for this cohort, they're actually coming from diverse individuals, which allows to also do some very interesting genetic analysis. So overall, this is a large single cell uh, effort generating a single project and includes more than 6.3 million uh, single cell profiles. Um, of course, when you get this kind of very big data and when you're thinking about harmonize and integrative analysis, um, you need to also think about scalable tools that they can actually help you to do very robust analysis. And as part of those AMP efforts, we have been generating new tools specifically tailored for single cell analysis. So both of them, they are like a linear mixed model that you can actually apply to look for differences across cases and controls in terms of the cell type composition, or to be able to explore sources of variation in your gene expression data and identify differences in the gene expression across cases and controls. And just to show one example, this is not the AMPD data, but this is the PsychAD that includes a few PD cases. So this is just preliminary data, and we expect that the power of the AMPD is going to be way higher. But even looking one brain region and having 30 individuals with PD versus 126 controls, we see a very interesting upregulation of perivascular macrophages that exist within the PD cases. So that again brings some interesting interplay between the immune system and might be some interesting interaction between adaptive innate immune system in the periphery and the CNS. And then when you start doing gene expression analysis, you can also identify specific markers within specific cell types. One of the most important dysregulated are the different endothelial cells. And over there, you can see that the top gene that is not regulated is DECTOR, which is part of the mTOR pathway. And this is a pathway among many other that seems to be having a very important role in the alpha synuclein metabolism. So again, I would like to thank the FNIH, the AMPD, and the NINDS. Um, I, and I would like to thank many of the um, individuals that they contribute brain and the different kind of brain repositories, as well as many different in the people in the group that were actually working on the data analysis and the data generation. Thank you. So um, we're a little bit different order than we expected, but um, transcriptomics and AMP PD. So um, actually, it better be titled um, really focused on um, the whole blood derived transcriptomics that came from PAX gene tubes. And so this is a collaboration with myself, um, Kendall Van Karen Jensen, folks at Michael J. Fox working um, to advance a series of kind of really two different studies. Um, and bringing them together. Um, and so our overall goal was to support the use and analysis of AMPD with really the focus on integration visualization and integrative analysis. And again, focusing on the whole blood derived transcriptomic data. As part of this, I'm gonna be talking about some of the resources we developed to enable that were mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, talk a little bit about the, the samples and then highlight some of the findings that we've identified in terms of our overall goals of figuring out biomarkers. As you see here, this is from the web portal, which is integrated nicely within the, um, the, the kind of Google Cloud backbone. And that's really nice because it allows people to um, have a, kind of a standardized framework by which to work with a kind of a simple 
single factor authentication, or I guess it's dual factor, but a framework. So one of the interesting things about the um, study is we see a lot of numbers going by. What I want to focus in on is there was a subset of individuals that had whole genome sequencing, but also had um, blood correct collected at different time points. And they were collected in PAX gene tubes, which is a type of tube if you, you, you collect it and you can send it to a centralized place. And essentially, when you shake it, everything's kind of um, broken apart. And then you have access to all the lymphocytes, but also the erythrocytes. However, it creates a very standardized workflow. And then those went to one place for several different studies. And that's at Indiana under um, a really great group there. And it means that we had access to RNA from a series of different studies. Two of these derived from um, PPMI and then also PDBP. So they're effectively collecting them. And there was, I think, nine or so different collection sites. But we get time points. And what you're seeing in the Sankey diagram is different time points for the PPMI study and also for the PDBP study. And so if we look over on the right, we see that we have a number of individuals who are whole genome sequence. But then we have a subset of both where we have multiple time points of RNA. And I think the actual number is around 4,500. And so that really became the focus of this to analyze them kind of jointly together. Um, as part of the portal and part of the development, we did create kind of resources that walk through how we looked at analyzing it in terms of the methodology. And all of this is up on the web page and can be made accessible, but also having repositories, GitHub repositories, as well as Terra notebooks to make sure that we could reproduce it. One of the important things is to realize that we can integrate all this together and we can use these frameworks to look at the subsets in the table on the right. You're just seeing when you start to think about, well, all of the different clinical all the different clinical information that we can integrate and look at together. That's really kind of one part I'm trying to show there. There are a number of different harmonized variables and you can dig quite deep. And that's part of really what is the value of this resource. So one of the things we put a lot of effort in um, over the past several years was looking at quality control. And it was very nice that there was a kind of a standard place where all the samples went. And, um, but then there's a lot of information that had to be done, a lot that had to be collected along the way. So one of the things I'm showing here is analysis of partition. And uh, if you see a PCA plot, you kind of see there's always some samples which have a kind of variety of different qualities, but there's quite a bit which show kind of two boluses. One thing you're looking at the PCA is a split by sex. We looked a lot at different covariates. And if you actually look at the bottom, you could see the different PCA correlates in all of the different parts. And there's a yellow streak. If you look way over at the right of that, you'll see the parts where you'll see kind of orange three little spots. And that was one important aspect. One thing that drove a lot of our early analysis was that some of the PCs down at three or four correlated to um, cl um, clinical variables that we had, in particular neutrophil counts um, and lymphocyte counts. Before I dive too much more into that, there was a, some additional kind of effort put into making sure that the data had browsers enabling people to look and analyze the data and get kind of first views and ask questions about a gene to see if they could identify anything. Maybe a lot of times somebody's interested in a gene, they just want to kind of look at a cohort. This was one example where you could pull up information, but then also correlate it and bring in kind of a genome browser type view that we did have different sorts of information put into. I want to kind of talk a little bit, though, about some of the findings that we identified. And one of the first ones was this idea that we were seeing a um, dependence on neutrophils. And one of our findings that was put out in the Nature Aging paper was um, really that neutrophils are enriched overall in PD. And we see this first in these volcano plots, where on the blue is all of the genes that are associated with neutrophil enrichment. And what you can see is they're predominantly on one side, which correlates or kind of makes sense with this PCA plots. On, some, on the subset of the samples of PPMI, we actually had lab cell counts. And we could look at this and see this isn't just an artifact. This is something that is a true finding, that there is a dependence of neutrophils on PD. We went further in looking at this, and in the paper it describes looking at prodromal and versus age. And overall, it's kind of an important 
aspect of one of our early findings, is dependence on um, neutrophil and the percentage that it changes whether or not a person has PD, whether or not it's age. And that becomes an important aspect to understand. We are dealing with a mixture of cells. And so some of the more kind of, um, since the more recent is, you kind of say, well, what if we look at this and we correct for um, the, the neutrophils? And this is actually where it gets interesting. So what we could do is we could identify an expression score since we had a subset of samples, we knew the actual counts from an orthogonal kind of measure that was taken in a clinical lab. We could then build a predictive expression um, score for all of the samples. And then, in essence, we have the percentage neutrophils for all the samples, and we can kind of now correct them. So we're not just looking at a subset, now we're looking at all of them. And then conduct differential expression, adjusting for this neutrophil dependence. And the one finding I'll highlight is one of the genes that's significantly differentially decreased is um, alpha-synuclein SNCA. And this is actually really interesting because when you dig into it, you find it makes sense with a lot of the genetic data. We see it strongest in individuals who happen to carry or harbor a mutation in alpha-synuclein. And it also is intriguing because one of the more important, interesting findings within PD of the past few years is these related to these alpha-synuclein seeding assays that are done with CSF. So it kind of opens the door and starts us to ask what is really kind of going on here? Are we have something that may be independent of this neutrophil findings? Is it a marker? Why are we seeing it? But alpha-synuclein is obviously one of the most important genes when we look at PD, and so this kind of sets up a series of additional questions that we wouldn't have gotten to had we not kind of dug a lot further, and this is kind of the, the more emerging aspect of where we were. We spent a lot of time looking at other aspects like differential splicing. I think this is one that was a lot more challenging for us and had a lot to do with the nature of having a whole transcriptome where we randomly primed um, sometimes it's harder to see these intron exon boundaries. We found some evidence that's interesting and we want to kind of follow further on, such as with the gene cancel one, um, which actually shows some evidence for differential splicing. It's really tricky with that gene because it's so close to the tau locus with its heavy LD. Um, we, so we put all these together. We worked a lot with the techno team and also Matt Bookman and the team and Google of how to make sure that everything we developed from a visualization was able to seamlessly work with the authentication and make sure that we could actually provide as much information but make sure that it was secure as possible to the end users. So overall, this kind of brings me to the last slide here and it highlights some of the key people that have contributed along the way. Um, it doesn't mention actually the Technome and Matt Bookman and how much effort they put helping us here, but really presenting some of the interactive resources for exploring whole blood transcriptome analysis that were generated as part of this. The findings of neutrophils being enriched in PD, um, but then the more recent finding of seeing the alpha synuclein is differentially expressed in the whole blood once you're controlling for the neutrophils. So that brings me to the end, right on time. That right this time. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and Amaya and I are going to tag team this presentation where we're going to talk to you about how we've done some targeted proteomics for biomarker discovery in uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, but before we start, I think we just wanted to acknowledge everyone that's been involved in this, both within AbV as well as the external teams, FNIH, uh, have been key in getting a lot of these things initiated. Um, and this was, uh, you know, that was part of the reason we actually got these done on time. The Technome team has been super key to getting all of the data out, so thank you to them. Um, of course, our external collaborators as well. So the goal of this analysis, when we started this off, we w spoke with our internal Parkin uh, Parkinson's disease team, our precision medicine team, and we asked them, what, what do we want to be identifying? And the idea was to actually identify biomarkers for clinical use, where we start off with this larger data set where we are generating O-link data, which is more sort of unbiased. Um, and then we develop specific assays for biomarkers that are discovered by this, and then develop and validate it for eventual use in clinical trials. 
Um, and I know we've talked a little bit about Olink in the, you know, in the morning session as well as in the afternoon. I just wanted to give you a quick overview of what this is. It's, it's basically called a proximity extension assay with next-gen sequencing readout. And so it, it includes an immunoassay where you have two antibodies come and bind to the antigen of interest, and each of these antibodies has a, a tag on it. And when these antibodies come in close proximity, those tags hybridize, and then that's what's read out by next-gen sequencing. What we did was to use the Olink Explore because previous data in AMPD has been generated on the Olink Explore 1536, the one that I've highlighted in green. But since then, there have been other versions of this platform that have come out, including the Olink Explore 3000, as well as the Olink Explore HD, which is currently being established in the lab. And this spans about 5,400 proteins. So when we reached out to FNIH and said that we, we would really like to do some O-link analysis um, on PD patients, we said we would like to integrate a longitudinal sample set, which would include matched plasma and CSF, and this would complement what had already been generated as part of the AMPD efforts. Um, and so what, we, what they told us was that they'd already had a conversation with PPMI about generating O-link on a subset of prodromal PD, uh, and recently diagnosed PD as well as healthy controls. Now, Amea is gonna go into a little bit of this later, but essentially we have to include bridging samples when we're combining two data sets, and so we also made sure that we included that. Now, this is a busy slide. All I wanted to, uh, everyone to take away from this was that we were increasing the sample numbers. So with the initial AMPD data set, there was really not as much power to detect the differences between groups, and so we were increasing that number to about 130 per, per group. Uh, additionally, I also wanted to point out that in addition to the things that we did internally, which is highlighted in the red box, uh, there were other cohorts that were also prodromal PD that were being generated at Olink at the same time. And this was driven by Britt Mollenhauer in Munich. With that, I think I'm going to pass this on to Amea. Okay, thank you, Aparna. Um, so I'm going to go into the research questions, some results, and kind of the next steps for um, our targeted proteomics analysis. Um, so the three questions that I've highlighted in green here, if I can get the pointer working. Um, all right, so um, the three questions are, the first one is differential protein abundance between Parkinson's disease patients and healthy controls at each time point and longitudinally. Um, the second one is proteomic changes with PD progression. So I think one of the biggest trends of AMP PD is the longitudinal collection of these samples. And so we can monitor as PD patients clinically progress, how do the, how do the peripheral protein abundance changes. And then because we have collected matched plasma and CSF from the same individuals, um, it's really interesting to look at plasma versus CSF comparisons and see if there are certain trends that we observe because CSF requires a lumbar puncture and every time you cannot really do a lumbar puncture to identify certain biomarkers as we are uh, using these for um, clinical studies later on. Um, so Aparna mentioned a little bit on the bridging um, samples. So because there was an initial data set that was generated by um, uh, Olink in collaboration with PPMI and AMP, um, one of the things that we wanted to include was to actually add a few samples that were uh, profiled before and use these to calculate the median of paired differences and use that as an adjustment factor to account for the batch effects between the study. And on the left here, you will see a PCA plot where um, the CSF D0 data set 01 is the original data set and data set 2 is the AbV collaborated data set. Uh, you can clearly see that there, there is a big difference between the two. And once we include a bridging normalization, as you can see on the right, um, the uh, effects due to the different data sets are actually mitigated. Um, just looking at some overall QC, um, this is a principal components analysis plot. Uh, I've just shown CSF as an example here, but um, color-coded by the diagnosis. So this is, uh, in red are the cases, um, in green are healthy controls, and in blue are other Parkinsonian disorders. Um, we don't see a clear clustering, but um, uh, this actually prompted us to investigate further into what are the differences between each of those diagnoses. Um, with sex, we don't see any direct uh, evidence of clustering based on sex, and neither do we see with the age at baseline of these samples. 
Um, these are the overall results between PD patients and healthy controls. So um, the table on the left, it's a, it's a busy table, but basically it includes the sample sizes, the number of individuals per group for PD, for healthy controls at different time points. Um, and these are the number of differentially expressed proteins uh, identified in the plasma and CSF. And what we can see is that um, although the changes are subtle, um, we see most changes observed in the CSF at month 24 or year two. And the volcano plot here actually reflects which changes these, those are. And in plasma, we see those at month 48, um, which is year four, so a little bit later than what you see in the CSF. But the takeaway here is that the protein with the most abundant change is this protein called DDC. And keep that in mind because I'll come back to this protein at the, at the last slide. Um, the other thing we wanted to explore was protein abundance changes with PD progression. And the way that we defined PD progression was using the MDS UPDRS score. So this is um, an aggregate score that looks at the non-motor aspects of daily living of these patients, motor aspects of daily living, and motor examinations. And there are specific criteria that are used for calculating each of these scores. And as you can see in these bottom, pl bottom spaghetti plots here, on the left are these PD patients worsening over time. So there's a clear trajectory. Although there's a big heterogeneity, there's still an upward trajectory of the increase or the worsening of the score, whereas in healthy controls, it stays constant over time. And we use this measurement to uh, identify which proteins are directly associated with these changes. And these are the volcano plots on the right. On the left is the plasma, on the right is the CSF. We see a myriad of changes happening uh, after we adjust for sex and data set and include um, a subject as, a random, uh, as the random effect. And clearly, um, we want to investigate further, but one of the main things that we wanted to do here is to understand what these proteins are. And are these actually coming from the brain or are they coming from other parts, other tissues um, uh, that, that may go wrong with PD? And so using the GTEx data, we actually queried some of the brain-enriched proteins, and uh, you will see that some of the other tissues that were enriched on the, on the top plot here. But the takeaway here is that um, there are these nine PD progression-related pro uh, proteins in the plasma that are actually enriched in the brain. And when you look at the correlation between the plasma and CSF, you can clearly see that overall the correlation is, is low, is moderate, but Looking at those brain-enriched proteins specifically, they're very close to the R equals one, which indicates that these proteins are, some, are the ones to follow up on, which are reflected both in plasma and CSF. Um, and coming back to this protein DDC, which is DOPA decarboxylase, this is the protein that we saw to be the most um, significant and most abundantly changing as PD is progressing, and also between PD and healthy controls. And this, is, this actually probed some investigation into what this protein is, whether this is a drug-induced change or whether this is a disease biomarker. Um, initially, this is actually an, is a metabolite that is responsible for synthesis of dopamine and um, serotonin uh, via decarboxylation of L-DOPA. And um, it is directly in the pathway of the drug that is included, uh, that, that is given to PD patients. Um, however, we, when we actually looked at this, uh, there are other groups who have published um, similar studies that show increase in DDC in other Parkinsonian disorders, including Lewy body disease. So um, this is something that we want to follow up on, but this is a very interesting protein to look at um, as, a, as, a, as a potential biomarker of PD progression. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide here, but coming to the conclusions, um, we want to validate, we want to look at additional cohorts, including the prodromal cohort uh, with, in collaboration with uh, Britt Mollenhauer's team, and then some additional analysis, especially some of the integration with whole genome sequencing, RNA sequencing, um, building classifiers to um, separate PD versus healthy controls, and then also look at other relevant clinical metrics to uh, identify how these proteins change in, with specific PD-associated diagnosis uh, in these patients. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much.
Buddy, my name is Mary Macarius. I am a PhD candidate under Dr. Andy Singleton, who couldn't join us today, so you're stuck with me today. Um, but I just would like to talk about the finding that we found in this African and African admixed GWAS. So a little bit before that, I'm going to reintroduce GP2, which Matt and Deb already did a great jo job of. Uh, but GP2 is a complementary initiative working with AMP PD, so everything's housed on the same platform, uh, and it's generating data across the word, uh, world. The intention here is obviously uh, collecting from different countries around the world, but to have it all be under one platform so people don't have to travel and people don't have to access multiple different platforms to get access to this. Currently, right now, that number is actually outdated. We've released our release six earlier this year. We're about 45,000 samples. Uh, a bulk of those are obviously European, but there is a substantial amount in other populations as well and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, this map is also outdated, so I encourage you to look at the gp2.org website if you are interested. And I've listed out the steps here on how we work with AMP. Uh, you go to the AMP PD website, you fill out the tier two form, which Matt already explained, is kind of accessing the, the clinical uh, in addition to the genetics and omics data that we have available. GP2 right now is really just focused on genetics, but across the planet. Uh, it's about a two-week turnaround time, and hopefully we can get you started from there. Talking a little bit about the cohort enrollment, and I'll spend some time on some of the cohorts we've worked, for, we've worked with for this research, uh, but we prepare the sample manifest. We take on our end a really extensive amount of sample harmonization, clinical data harmonization, and I'm proud to say that as part of release six, there's actually clinical information for about 10,000 individuals already released. Uh, so we do a lot of that data in-house. We also process and QC it for you. What we make available to the community is actually imputed genotypes that we've already QC'd. These are imputed against TopMed, uh, raw genotypes, clinical information if available, and we're working towards releasing more whole genome sequencing. These tend to be for monogenic families. Uh, everybody else gets genotyping. Uh, we make the, same, uh, the summary statistics available, the data browsers that we've already looked at earlier in this panel, uh, and we also make an extensive amount of training available. There's about 60 or 70 videos. They're translated into 100 or so different languages. It walks you through what data is available, how to access the platform, how to run some basic genetics analyses, and things of that sort. Uh, we also host workshops, and I know there's one happening right now uh, in Colombia. It's happening today and tomorrow. So, regarding the study cohorts that were involved in this particular research, I could spend all day talking about each of these three amazing initiatives, but very briefly, we work with the International Parkinson's Disease Genomics Consortium, Africa, IPDGC for short. Uh, this is run by Mia Rizek. I encourage you to look at these manuscripts if you're interested, but this is really representative of a lot of Africa. Here, for this particular research, though, the bulk of our samples come from West Africa, specifically Nigeria. Uh, so this comes from the Nigerian Parkinson's Disease Research Network, NPDR, which is led by the really amazing Injetika Okupiju, and the Black PD Initiative, which is under GP2, also available through the NPD portal. This is led by Dr. Bendra Siga here at the NIH. Um, and there's multiple recruitment sites, and I think they're adding four more recruitment sites this year. On to the results. So a little bit of the research in context, I don't need to preach to the choir here, but I am just going to reiterate that obviously a lot of the genetics results uh, and the genetics data that's made available is usually made available for those of European ancestry. We're looking to break away from that just a little bit just to have a more representative image of the disease. Uh, so there's both a social and scientific imperative to do that. Uh, this is something that's really near and dear to my heart. I, myself, am Middle Eastern, don't really see myself represented in this data, and this is why uh, I wanted to spend some time on this. So the examination of previously understudied ancestral groups is really what led us here today, and this has implications in therapeutic development, and I'll go into that a little bit later. Obviously, this was a massive, massive piece of work. Uh, this got published in Lancet late, later last year. 
Uh, and this is really the proof of concept of GP2 working together with AMP to make this possible. Uh, so it works with the different study cohorts that I mentioned. We worked with 24 different Nigerian institutions to make this happen, all the black PD sites. Uh, and also we worked with 23andMe who contributed their summary statistics for this study. So we're looking at about 1,500 cases. These get broken up into African and African admixed. I'll talk a bit about that in the next slide. So we're looking about 1,500 cases total, PD positive, uh, and 200,000 controls. The workflow here, I'll go through it quite briefly. Uh, so we did go through the recruitment. Everyone here is familiar with that. Genotyping, we use the NeuroBooster array, which has the Illumina human diversity as the backbone, and then another 95,000 custom content for specifically neurodegenerative diseases. We in-house at GP2, we've got our own QC platform. This includes a custom machine learning prediction algorithm that leverages HapMap, the 1,000 genomes, and an Ashkenazi Jewish panel, so we can even tease apart between European to Ashkenazi Jewish, and we break those apart uh, into African and African admixed. Anyone who has uh, about 90% or higher, we've classified them into the African portion, African cohort, and anyone who has admixture of other ancestries beyond 10% were classified as African admixed. Uh, so this has been through ASAP, the Black PD, and 23andMe as well. So after that, we had two specific cohorts that were African and one that was African admixed. We've classified 23andMe as the African admixed here. Um, so we decided to run the meta-analysis uh, specific to the ancestries first. Didn't see anything when we looked at just the African admixed. We did see a hit in the African when we meta-analyzed that. Leveraging everybody together though, we see that hit just a bit stronger. And if this was a GOS talk, I would stop right here. Except I will go into the results just a little bit and how we decided to te tease them apart. Uh, so that particular variant up there, uh, that's an intronic variant in GBA1. For those familiar with Parkinson's disease, GBA1 is not a new gene associated with the disease at all, except this particular variant is not in LD with any of the previously associated variants of Parkinson's disease. Uh, but it is in the same gene that we already know is, is familiar. So we knew we were kind of on the right track. Uh, GBA1 is also a notoriously difficult gene to work with because about 50% of its um, structure overlaps with its pseudogene, GBA-P1. Uh, so that significant variant, we still needed to tease it apart a bit. So looking across other known risk loci, so obviously a lot of the PD work that had been done before had been done in European populations. What we wanted to look at was of those 90 risk loci that were already established from European studies, what did it look like across populations? I know this is quite tiny. The colors are really meant to indicate here that across populations, we're not looking at the same direction. We're not even looking at the same uh, Significance, we're not even looking at the same magnitude if they're even available in that population at all. Moving forward with our variant that we found here, uh, this is the locus zoom plot, but I did want to point your attention to the different, um, just the percentage that it's available in cases and controls. So our risk variant here is G. It's a little confusing because in the reference panel, it's also G. So the risk allele here is G for this particular variant. Uh, and it's found in about 18, or, excuse me, 14% of the homozygous carriers of PD. Uh, and it's found in almost 41% uh, of heterozygous carriers of PD. Uh, that's just in the African data. It looks a little different when you've got admixture in your genome, of course, and a lot of follow-up that we're doing here is regarding local ancestry for individuals so we can really narrow down at that particular, you know, region of your chromosome what ancestry you might be. So looking ahead, I hadn't heard anyone talk about this explicitly, but the population attributable risk, like I said, variants in GBA1 have been previously associated not only with Parkinson's disease, but with other lysosomal dis disorders as well. Um, so we wanted to see this particular variant that we identified 
In just the African and African admixed populations, how does it fare to other known GBA variants that we know of? Think N370S for the Ashkenazi Jewish population. And we find that taking into account the population attributable risk, this is a lot more common and a lot more aggressive in the African and African admixed populations compared to other GBA1 variants previously associated with PD that we knew of. So moving forward with that, we wanted to see uh, its effect size. And about 13% of cases are homozygous, so uh, comparing to controls 3.5 times, um, PD, PD individuals are 3.5 times more likely to have this risk variant. Uh, we wanted to look at the age of onset because we were fortunate enough that the physician we were working with was collecting a, quite a bit of phenotype information. So based on our linear regression results, we found that each copy of the, each copy of the allele uh, results in two to three times earlier risk, um, earlier susceptibility of disease. Based on our machine learning algorithms as well, per individual, we can actually break down the amount of each ancestry you are. Say, for example, me, you can break down that I'm 80% Middle Eastern, 20% something else. We can do the same with the individuals that were part of this study. And so we ran a linear regression based on the percentage admixture here, uh, genomic admixture, and we found that the risk allele was positively associated with um, the higher percentage of African, admix, uh, African population that you have, suggesting an African founder effect. Uh, and then moving forward here, we also had and I did not put in the slides RBD questionnaires for these individuals, and this particular risk variant is also associated with uh, earlier onset, in addition to RBD, which REM sleep behavior disorder is a node prodromal um, syndrome of Parkinson's disease. So we looked into the functional effect here. Long story short, we didn't find too much. We, didn't, we performed some short read whole genome sequencing, didn't find an, a coding variant, performed long read whole genome sequencing, thinking that this particular variant was tagging a coding variant, not likely. We performed uh, long read to see if it was actually tagging a structural event of some sort, also no. We did, perf we did perform some fine mapping, uh, and this is supposed to be the causal variant here. Uh, we looked into open targets to see, and we saw that it was associated with an EQTL, uh, but there is evidence to suggest that it is also a uh, splicing variant of some sort, and so we're looking into that now. I'm preaching to the choir here as well regarding like the amount of data that's available um, across different populations. Here we did find that there was a paper that looked specifically at just gene expression in African Americans and Latinos uh, using their blood, and we ran uh, and we plotted this on a locus zoom and saw that it was quite. Um, significantly associated with uh, EQTL in blood. So quick summary here, the collaborative efforts really made uh, this possible. Everybody here, the accessible joint through the, um, accessible through a joint agreement with AMP PD. Uh, it was about 1,500 PD patients, so for everyone here who's familiar with GWAS, obviously that is a really modest sample size, but we did get to learn a lot from it. Uh, so not previously in LD or associated with other variants that we know with um, either GBA or PD risk. Uh, it, is, it does have a higher population attributable risk compared to other known variants in this gene. Uh, and it's the first intronic variant in GBA1 that we've actually associated with disease here. Uh, it is highly correlated to percent African ancestry, suggesting the founder effect. But because it is an intronic variant, can we look into something like gene expression, RNA-based therapeutics, which was not initially um, brought up for Parkinson's disease in the past? And with that, thank you. So I can see we have five minutes for questions. Uh, and so I'll open it up. Anyone with questions? Oh, Johan Björkegren. I was just wondering about the neutrophiles. Uh, those were in circulation, right? So, so I'm just curious, what is the relevance of, 
of, of those as markers, what are known about neutrophiles in, in the etiology of, 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 of Parkinson's disease? No. So that's a really interesting question, and there's a part where you start to wonder, you know, is this something that's generalizable? Is it relate to neuroinflammation in the brain? One of the key things to answer that question is to be able to also have RNA-seq from specimens, and that's why when he walked up here, I told him I was pretty excited, because I'm, there's a lot of questions that that kind of evokes. It could just be that these people are sicker, right? Um, is it something that we see in other neurodegenerative disorders? And that's where really trying to look at, like, in the morning I was listening to the AMP-80, trying to think, okay, do some of the markers that I see, like alpha synuclein when I correct, are they different? And so what I'm left with at the neutrophils is one, you know, you say, ooh, it'd be nice to have single cell. Well, that didn't exist when they started to collect. Um, I really want to understand, is this something that is kind of a broader effect of uh, people getting sicker, or is there very specific bio biology and pathology that connects it to the, the, the neuroendophenotype? So um, I wish I had the answer to your question, but I think it's part of the types of things that we're asking as well. Thank you. And I had a question for Panos also. The, the brain areas you're looking at, what, what are the evidence for these different, um, yes, yes, are, are there any sort of time course or related to symptoms for Parkinson's disease? That's a very good question. So we actually selected brain regions that we know based on existing staging system. These regions on average will be affected in different states of disease. So we have the selection of three different brain regions. So we try to get one early, which is Bragg stage one and two. Then we try to get one that is like moderate um, progression, which is like stage three and four. And then we have the late um, progression of the very severe cases that is according to Bragg stage five and six. Um, and again, this rely on existing pathology. We're looking for distribution of alpha synuclein in different brain regions. And one, it's only one of the staging system, but I think it's one of the most kind of validated up to now. But again, you know, when you do this kind of approaches, hopefully in the future we can do more kind of data-driven approaches, much larger ascertainment of different brain regions, and then combine single cell, spatial, and other kind of immunohistochemistry to really uncover new kind of pathologies. That's, I think, what we need to come up with new staging system. Hi, my name is Michael Giverts. I'm a heart failure transplant cardiologist from Boston. Uh, so AMP, you know, stands for Accelerating Medicines Partnership, and I just I, I'm amazed, and, and I didn't understand some of the things that was presented, but certainly the discovery science and the translational work that you guys are doing is incredible. But I wanted to just bring it back to the patient for a second, and maybe Dr. Babcock can take this question because I, I'm going to see a patient next week in clinic who I've been following for several years. And he has uh, advanced heart failure, but we've made tremendous progress in his treatment with probably four new drugs and devices that have all been approved uh, and instituted in the last 15 to 20 years. And unfortunately, he has severe Parkinson's disease, which has been progressive over the years. Um, and he's been treated primarily by a surgical treatment that was approved about 25 years ago. And he's still on a drug that was approved over 50 years ago. So when I see him in clinic next week, and I tell him I was at this conference, I mean, all this wonderful science that's going on, how, how close should I tell him and his son that you are to actually uh, bring a therapy to him? Okay, that's not a fair question. <laughs> <laughs> I like that it's for her. <laughs> We're working on it. Uh, you know, neurodegenerative diseases are really tough because brain cells, there is some uh, regeneration of brain cells, but not a whole lot. And once the degeneration cascade starts, we have never found anything that uh, stops it, uh, at least in Parkinson's disease. But I think uh, now that we have antibody drugs for treating Alzheimer's disease, uh, we've got some, uh, some hope for coming up with antibodies against alpha-synuclein. This is a much harder protein uh, and fibrils and uh, 
It's, it's a really tough nut to crack. We've been having trouble developing PET ligands, antibodies. I mean, this protein is really funky. Uh, but with the advent of antibody-related drugs for Alzheimer's disease and the progress we've made with, uh, with PET ligands and seeding assays, I think we're getting there. So uh, is it going to happen tomorrow? No. But I, I see the progress. To me, the progress seems to be moving faster than it's been in the last 10 years. So I, I'm optimistic. And I'll turn it over to anybody else who wants to address that question. I just have a quick note on that. I guess it's different where you are, what the progress might look like. Because in Nigeria, uh, we've already heard feedback based on the finding uh, that more people want to contribute to research. Now, before, even a few months before, people were hiding at home with this disease. They, you know, the tremor, they associated it with the devil. And so it's a little bit different. Obviously, progress is different to different people. Uh, but for there, we're making quite a bit of progress. Hi, everyone. I wanted to say thank you so much for the talk. My name's Kai Kelly, and I'm an undergraduate from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I have a question uh, for Dr. Kumar and Dr. Kulkarni. I wanted to see if you could speak a little bit to uh, the protein that you were discussing that was related to dopamine, and if you intended to do any future studies, maybe looking at localization, and if so, do you expect to see it more so in the substan substantia nigra or other areas in particular? Um, yes, so I think the first thing that we, wanted, we, we would like to see is in drug-naive population, do we still see um, an upregulation of the same protein? Um, that is one of the reasons why we are going after the prodromal cohort, where they're still relatively early in their Parkinson's diagnosis, and if we do see something there, then that is a confirmation that this is not a drug-induced biomarker change, but a disease-associated change. Um, in terms of the localization, um, we don't have an immediate um, plan to do it, uh, but it, we, one of the things that we are interested in looking at is how many of these peripheral protein changes are actually linked to proteins that are secreted out of the dopaminergic neurons, which is the kind of the key um, cell type in Parkinson's. And so um, in, within AbbVie, we are looking at um, the secretome from an iPSC-derived dopaminergic line and maybe if, if we do see correlations there, then that might be something to consider. And just to add to what Amaya said, and I think he mentioned this in the talk as well, there have been other publications where they have seen DDC show up as a potential biomarker. This is in LBD, which is typically not treated with the same drugs, mm -hmm. um, and in other larger cohorts like BioFinder where DDC was seen. So I think there is clearly something that we want to move forward and do additional validation on this. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, my name is Virginia Savova from Sanofi. Uh, I've been mostly involved in the uh, AMP uh, AIM, and before that, AMP or ASLE, and I'm fairly new to the to the neuro side. Um, I, as as many people pointed out, right, that the methods are different, and as David pointed out, you didn't have single cell RNA sequencing when you started, and uh, there are questions, however, that point to cell types, and uh, you have done this uh, very interesting analysis on, on neutrophils already. Uh, one question I had is, what, what is available today are bioinformatic deconvolution approaches that you can apply to RNA sequencing data, right, and estimate the fractions of cell types from um, RNA sequencing data on blood. Uh, have you done that? If not, why not? Are there any technical difficulties with that? I think at uh, the end of the day, what we did do successfully was create a score for neutrophils based on the expression, really from genes that are neutrophil specific. And that allowed us to um, identify some really encouraging and, and interesting results. Now, the question is, these deconvolution methods overall to do it, right, as an automated way, we, we did that, and um, this is predominantly a couple different people, um, about 2020, 2021, and we weren't overly in love with those deconvolution results. Um, every once in a while, we go back to them, um, and so I think that um, 
I have a feeling if I went back to them today, they probably would work a lot better because there's more single cell data that's gone out there. Um, uh, and so um, I think that these tools are often getting better with shared data, but at the time we did this, um, when they were run just ad hoc um, across the board, they didn't really provide us the results that gave us any confidence, but I think that they probably would be better now. Maybe if I can add on that. So um, deconvolution approaches are very interesting, and they can be quite powerful, especially for blood. However, on the other side, if you do deconvolution, it can indicate which specific cell type might be the most affected. And I believe from a mechanistic perspective, it can really give very limited information, at least based on our experience. I think nowadays, you know, with the new technologies, you can do actually single cell multiomics. You can actually profile at the same time expression, proteomic profiling, and really start looking how the different cells and subtypes they interact with each other because you, what you really want to uncover, since so you're talking about the immune system, you would like to see how the different adaptive and innate immune cells seems to be actually interacting in terms of disease progression. And I think that's something you cannot get with the deconvolution, but you know, with single cell can be much more powerful analysis. No, I mean, I'm, I'm totally a fan of single cell, and I would, yeah. I, I, you certainly should collect single cell data if you have, but for, what you, for the data set you have already collected, it would be really good if some of the newer approaches can be applied because you can get uh, at least fractions of cell types. So we sh I should clarify, the, when I described this, you know, they started these, these um, longitudinal studies, and you collect the blood, um, the patient comes in, and then you shake the tube immediately, the, the nurse will, and that really b basically um, lyses all of the cells in the PAX gene, and so in that way, you know, when we're looking and been sequencing these, some of these samples were collected at the start of the study in maybe 2010, 2011, which much preceded this. And then when AMP came around, they had the opportunity to really look at these for the first time. And so I think one of the things they do is frame how somebody might design new longitudinal studies where you preserve the ability to do that. That said, what, what, what you're working with natively still has them intact, particularly now that methods can look at like even FFPE. So from whole blood, um, I think that it's something that you'd wanna do kind of going forward to preserve the, so you can at least do single nuclei and so forth. 